But I believe that's a great endeavor for anybody. But I think in Olympic Games or any sports, probably one of the hardest is marathon. 26 miles. Olympic athletes run that in like two hour, five minutes, two hour, 10 minutes, 26 miles. It literally tests the limits of the human capacity. I think it's one of the hardest sports. The scripture uh, likens our own life like marathon, long distance race. So Apostle Paul, knowing that his martyrdom is approaching within weeks or within months, at the final stage of his life, this is what he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I have fought the good fight. I finished my race and I kept my faith. Therefore, there is now for me a crown of righteous, righteousness that God will give unto me. He said he finished the race. But not only Apostle Paul was running this race and finish. The scripture that we read, I read this morning, declares that all of us have a race marked out for us. What is this race marked out for us? It is lifelong journey of following Jesus. But when we finish this course, God will give reward. There is a reward, a word ceremony that happens. And that's why it is called a race. Not only it is a race that's marked up for us, there are audiences that's watching us and cheering us on. First one says, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Who are these great cloud of witnesses? Until last week, we were examining Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. Many of the saints that, that have gone before us, they are the great cloud of witnesses. For example, Enoch, who walked with God. So he didn't taste death. He was taken from earth to heaven without tasting death. There is Noah for 120 years, just holding on to the word of God. There wasn't a speck of cloud, rain cloud, but 120 years he built an ark, size of huge warship aircraft carrier. 120 years on top of a mountain building an ark. Then there is Abraham. He was given miraculous son at an old age. I mean, past, beyond childbearing age for himself and his wife. At 100 years old, his wife was 90. This is a miracle baby. And yet, when God demanded Isaac to be sacrificed when he was probably 12, 13 years old, Without hesitation, he would offer his one son that he has unto God. Then Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. Not only that, there was those who, by faith, overcame even the mouth of lions. We know that as Daniel. Or sown into prophet Isaiah. And last week we saw... Saints who didn't die as a martyr, but they lived their life almost like a martyr's. Wearing animal skins, experiencing hardship, destitute, persecution. They lived life of martyrdom. No matter what difficulty and hardship, they did not compromise. They did not give up. They walk with faith. So that they have obtained a good testimony. Testimony from God. It was God giving testimony that their faith is genuine, God pleasing. That, that they were commanded for their faith. All the saints who have gone before us, they are the great cloud of witnesses. Who are watching us and cheering us on. And not only them. Some of you have parents who prayed for you, moms, 
who prayed faithfully day, out, day in and day out in tears, praying for your soul. And they have left a legacy of faith at what it means to serve Jesus Christ with faithfulness, with this legacy leaving behind. They have been now taken into glory. Some of you have mentors in the church, spiritual leaders who have encouraged you, who have, who have taken you under their wings and, and discipled you and prayed for you and, and helped you to walk this journey. They have finished their race and they are now with the Savior. So they have also joined the heavenly throne, the great cloud of witnesses. And as we see these great cloud of witnesses, they are not just male spectators because they have walked this faith. They, they ran this race faithfully. They finished. And not only did they finish this race, they passed the baton to us. So in a sense, it's like a spiritual relay. It's a long-distance marathon, but it's like a relay. They have given us the baton, and they are one team with us, so they want us to finish well. And not only we finish well, but they want us to be able to pass on this baton to the next generation. Don't drop the baton. Pass on to the next generation. Mike was asking any who will volunteer for VVS because we want to pass this baton to the next generation. Because heaven's audience is watching us. Not only the saints who have gone before us or even your own praying mother, but the most important audience is God himself. God is watching us as we run this race and we, we, we express that with the Latin word, coram deo, in the face of God. Would you repeat after me? Coram deo, in the face of God. God is always watching us. We remember, uh-oh, I want to live my life in the face of God because God is watching me. Coram deo. So we are given this race. And there is audience cheering us on, the saints who have gone before us, even our parents are spiritual leaders, but God himself is watching us. You know when nobody seems to show interest in your life, God is watching you. Would you repeat after me? God is watching me. Heaven is watching me. Cheering you on, heaven's watching you. When no one else is looking, even if nobody responds to your social media post, that's not important. God is watching you. So how shall we run this race? It says, let us throw up everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. You know, when you watch like New York Marathon, Boston Marathon, or Olympic Marathon on TV, the runners, they, they show up they don't wear most expensive clothes. <laughs> they wear the lightest clothing, just, just bare, minimum. Actually, I was looking up in the Greek games a thousand years ago, or when this New Testament was written. You know, the Greek games, Olympic games just didn't happen in one city. Many of the, the city-states, they had their own Greek games. Corinth had their own game. Athens had their own games. So in these Greek games, athletes competed naked. They didn't want anything hinder. So even when they were working out in gymnasium, they were naked and they had just olive oil over their body and they were working out. And they said their toned body, the muscular body, they thought that was, in a sense, a gift, dedication, sacrifice to Zeus. That's how they competed. So actually in Olympic Games... Woman one allowed, married woman allowed in the audience. It was just males watching because men, all the athletes were naked. So when the, the apostle says, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin, he is picturing, look at these athletes in the Greek games. They don't want anything hinder. We need to have that kind of radical just commitment in this race. 
spiritual race. Get rid of all the temptation of sin. Say no to sin. The, thin, the sin that so easily entangles. That means with a sin in your life, unconfessed sin in your life. If you continue to live in the sin and carry this burden of sin, it will tie you up. It will entangle your feet. You can't run this race with the sin. Get rid of the sin. Even this morning as we come to worship God, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we want to rid ourselves of the sin. Whether in thoughts or words or in our deeds, anything that is not pleasing unto God. Sometimes these thoughts or words or our behavior has repeated and it became a pattern, it became a habit. But we need to get rid of this sin because it entangles our feet. We can't run this race. We can't follow Jesus with this burden of sin. Is it pride that has taken deep root in our heart and whenever it has chance, the pride, vanity, or the lust of the flesh? Or is it jealousy? Is it unhealthy relationship? Unhealthy appetite? In, for different things. Sometimes it could be holding on to wounds and resentment. When somebody has hurt you, holding on to that injury, I've mentioned numerous times, when we hold on to injury and sense of wounds, we drop the baton of faith, the baton of grace. You can't hold on to both. If you want to hold on to the baton of faith, baton of grace of God, you got to let go of the sense of offense. You got to let it go. Let go of the injury. Let the Lord deal with it, but I'll rather hold on to the grace of God. I want to run this race of faith. I don't want to drop this baton. So we have to forgive and let go. Galatians 5. Verse 24, Apostle Paul says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Lord, this morning, as we come to worship you, we declare our passions and desires have been crucified with our sinful nature. Even the sense of our injury, this unforgiving spirit, we declare it's been crucified with Jesus. Cleanse us from our sin. So we can run this race. <clears throat> you know who I think is the most unhappy people in the world? I think it's, it's a Christian, a believer whose hearts are divided. What I mean by that is this person has accepted Jesus into their heart. Hearing the gospel that in Christ, our sins are forgiven and we are given hope of eternal life. So this person opened his heart to Jesus Christ and yet he still gravitate toward the sinful things of the world, the pleasures of the world. And it's such a strong attraction. I don't want to let go. So this person wants to hold on to both Jesus and the pleasures of the world, both. So hearts divided and you are not happy in both. For example, if you have a wholehearted devotion for Jesus and living for Jesus, there will be fullness of joy that Scripture speaks about unspeakable joy. Joy unspeakable for those who surrender our lives to Jesus Christ and follow his leadership. There is joy. But the person with divided heart holding on to one foot in the world and one foot in Jesus you don't have this joy of Jesus in your heart and your Christian life. It becomes a religion almost like heavy burden because you have heard in Christ you are given forgiveness and salvation so you can't leave Jesus. You need Jesus but you still like the pleasures of the world and you want to have both and you don't have this joy of following Jesus wholehearted. But when you go toward the pleasures of the world you can fully enjoy it either because the Holy Spirit tells you that's not what a child of God is supposed to do. That's sinful. Those who doesn't have anything to with Jesus, they can just follow the pleasures of the world and they don't feel any guilt 
and his shame. They are fully in sin. They enjoy it. But those who have opened their heart to Jesus Christ, they have opened themselves to Holy Spirit's leadership and guidance. And the Holy Spirit says, this is sin. This is not clean. This is impure. A child, who ser child of God, holy God, you should not be involved in this. So when you're involved in the pleasure of the sinful pleasure of the world, you don't have this full joy, enjoyment, the temporary enjoyment even. You feel guilty. You feel miserable. That's why a Christian with a divided heart is the most miserable person, the most unhappy person. First one says, in King James, let us lay aside every weight. Whatever that hinders, actually, the Greek word itself is actually a noun, a weight, something that weighs you down. It may not be sin in itself, but in order for us to run this race that's been marked up for us, if it weighs us down, any weight, any excess weight, we want to take it off. And it may be different from everyone. Some things in life are not sin, but you may have tendency and weakness that if you pay attention to it and give thoughts to it, you become so involved, it becomes an addiction. It will become a bondage for you. But for somebody else, it may not interest them that much. It's, it's something light that they can easily pass on. So whatever weight may be different from one person to another. But if it's going to be extra weight for your race, the apostle says, let's lay aside. It may not be sin, but anything that weighs you down, let's lay aside. Have you heard? In order to receive the best from God, sometimes you have to give up what is okay, what is second best. If you want to receive the very best, you have to let go of what is second best. Let me give you a simple example that no one can forget. You know, you go to this large buffet with 30, 40 different offerings. And you see so many, so many things that they offer and you get a plate. One plate full, a second plate full. But remember, if you want to have cheesecake at the end, you have to save a room. So you may have to say no to the french fry or, or a piece of the chicken. You have to pass. There needs to be some room reserved if you want to have a cheesecake at the end. <laughs> In much the same way, if you want to receive the very best of what God offers, sometimes you will have to give up what is second best. Let go, because you are waiting for God's very best. And that's what Christ is speaking. He says, I have come that they may have life and abundantly. Life abundant, Christ is offering. If you willingly sacrifice your life, if you willingly give up your own plan and your own agenda and submit to God's will and God's purpose, God will allow you to experience the greatest joy and happiness on this side of eternity. And when life's journey comes to an end, you will be welcomed into life eternal. Sacrificing my, my agenda, my life for Jesus. And then experiencing the greatest joy and happiness the world cannot give. This is the irony of life. So he says, let us throw off everything that hinders any extra weight, as well as the sin that so easily entangles. So we can run this race. You know, when we think about Anything that hinders as well as sin, it also involves worry. Worry and concern. <clears throat> worry and concern doesn't help us. So scripture calls us, rather than worry, pray. Some of you say, you know, I'm responsible for many things. And because I'm a responsible person, I need to worry about it. Oh, yes, because you are a responsible person. Rather than worrying about it, you pray about it. You lift up to the Lord. You bring it to God in prayer. That's what Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. <clears throat> Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
then the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Would you repeat after me? Do not worry, but pray. Yeah. Worrying is also this burden that we need to let go of. Then what does it take to run this race? Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders as well as the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance. Because this race is not a short distance dash, but it's a long distance race like a marathon. It will require perseverance and endurance. You know, the ultimate goal of our Christian faith is not just going to heaven. Oh, yes, it is important that those who are living in sin, who are destined for eternal damnation in hell, child of the devil, he is rescued from sin, becomes a citizen of kingdom of heaven, children of God. That's great news, but that's not everything. It's not just going to heaven. For God, he so loved the world, he gave his one and only begotten son in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven of our sins. Power of sin has been broken. We are set free. Now those who's been forgiven, who's been born again. God's purpose is that we become more and more like the image of his son, Jesus Christ, day after day. Sanctification. Lifelong journey, becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Would you repeat after me? God wants us. To become like Jesus in our character, in the way we think, in the way we speak, in the way we carry ourselves and relate with people around us. God wants us to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And, and that is a lifelong journey like a marathon. It says you're going to need endurance. You need to persevere in this process. So in our journey of faith in this race, how you began is not as important as how we finish. If you do not persevere, you may give up in the middle. Some people have done very well for mid midpoint or three quarters of the way, but had miserable, ugly ending and finish in life. And that's why Apostle Paul with his heart burden. He was writing to the believers in Galatia. Do you want to, did you begin in Holy Spirit and now want to finish in the flesh? How can you begin in Holy Spirit and now, okay, God, I got this now. Let me go do it on my own. No, you can't do it in flesh. The journey of faith begins by the grace of God with the Holy Spirit. And you need to carry on this, this journey and faith. You need Holy Spirit's leading and guidance all the way. You need to rely on him. You can't do it on your own. Do not think that you began with the Holy Spirit, but you can maintain with the flesh and end in flesh. No, you will not. Would you repeat after me? Let us persevere. Let's have a strong finish. How many of you want to have a strong finish in your life? Can, can I get an amen for that? Lord, grant us the grace of God so that we will have a strong finish for our, our life. How do we gain the strength to endure for strong finish? It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Repeat after me. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Let Jesus be the goal. Let Jesus be the final destination of my life. Do not be distracted by looking, looking around. Just fix your eyes on Jesus. Looking at him. Let him consume your life. Let him consume all your interest. All your focus on him. Let him be the vision. The goal, my final destination of life. We looked through Hebrew chapter 11, I think almost a year, looking at different examples of the saints who have gone before us. And their walk, their faith, their examples provide great inspiration. But the strongest, 
the greatest strength and encouragement and, and strength to endure come from looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus Christ is not only the object of our faith and object of our worship, he is also the, the source, the origin of faith. You know, some translation says he is the pioneer of the faith. Why? Because he himself demonstrated what it means to submit to God's will in perfect obedience. So he actually pioneered the way of faith for all of us to follow. So he is the source, the originator, the pioneer of true way of faith. And not only that, by sending his Holy Spirit into our heart, Jesus Christ grants us the gift of faith. That's why he is the source, the author of the faith. And not only that, he is the perfecter of our faith. He fulfills all the prophecies, all the promises of God. So Jesus Christ is the perfecter of the covenants. And not only that, by his grace and mercy, he holds our soul. He holds our faith so that our weak faith will be perfected in him. In Luke chapter 22, during the Last Supper, when Jesus was foretelling how Peter will deny him three times, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, tonight Satan Require your soul. Satan was asking your soul like he will win. He will flip your soul. He wants to test your soul, but I pray for you so that your faith will not fail. Satan demanded your soul so that he can shift your soul like the wheat blowing in the wind. But I have test, I have prayed so that your faith will not fail. Christ, who prayed for not only Peter, but he prayed for you and for me, so that our weakened faith will be perfected in his grace and mercy. Hallelujah. So when we fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, in our journey, in our race of faith, whenever we encounter hardship and difficulty and trials come our way, when persecution come our way, when we look unto Jesus, he will grant us the strength to endure. You know, if we do not fix our eyes upon Jesus, we will get in trouble. I think the easiest trouble is comparing ourselves with others. You look at other people, how they serve the church or for the cause of the gospel. You look at their family, how they are doing in their marriage or how their children are doing. Or what kind of background do they have? You, know, you, you, you compare yourself with people around you. And it seems like if they are doing better than you, uh oh they are way ahead of me. You feel discouraged or you feel sorry for yourself, inferiority. Or you may feel jealousy, envy. How come they are doing so well? Or if you think you are doing better than them, you become proud. I am better than them. <laughs> How come they are so miserable? And in your pride, judge them for whatever struggle they are experiencing. That's a terrible place to be. Comparing ourselves to others. No. If we want to avoid this trap of sin, we want to fix our eyes upon Jesus. That we don't fall into this trap of comparing ourselves with others. So if we fix our eyes upon Jesus, <clears throat> what do we learn? Verse 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider him who endured such an opposition from sinful men. Wow. It says we need to examine the example of Jesus Christ who endured the suffering, the pain, the hardship, the shame of the cross. For what kind of joy was Jesus focusing on so that he could endure the, all the suffering and the shame? Two. There are two joy that Jesus was looking at. First was the victory of resurrection and glory. 
Jesus knew beyond, beyond the suffering of the cross, there will be the resurrection victory and his glory of ascension. You know, when Jesus appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus on that resurrection Sunday afternoon, as Jesus explained the scripture, he said, did not Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory. He was explaining Christ had to suffer and after that he will enter into his glory. He knew there will be suffering, but then there is a glory coming. What glory? Glory that is due to him, the name that is given above all names. Philippians chapter 2 says, when Jesus humbled himself, and submitted to God's will to rescue all of us. He submitted himself and humbled himself even to the point of dying on the cross. And then God raised him from the dead and, and raised him to the highest heaven. Gave him the name above every name so that every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus knew such a glory will come after the cross. Without the cross, there is no glory. So Jesus knew after his suffering, there will be resurrection, victory, and glory. And number two, the joy of seeing his redeemed people. Jesus saw the joy of the salvation of his people. Isaiah 53, 11 speaks about this. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. So after his suffering, he will be resurrected and he will be satisfied. How? By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. By bearing our iniquities and sin, he will justify many. He saw by his suffering on the cross, he will bring salvation to his people. And he saw joy. And that's why in the most painful, most humiliating form of execution, when Jesus was suffering on the cross, he saw the joy of seeing salvation of you and for me. Meaning, in his most painful moment, hanging on the cross, he was thinking about you and me. Your salvation and my forgiveness. That's why he endured the cross. He endured the shame. He endured the pain. So he says, because he endured the pain and the suffering on the cross for your salvation and my salvation, when we experience hardship and trials, if we fix our eyes upon Jesus, he will pour his grace and mercy, strength to endure. Hallelujah. And that's why the last verse says, Consider him who endured such an opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose your heart. When you experience disappointment, discouragement, when you experience hardship, when you experience opposition, when you experience ridicule of people who do not understand this way of faith, do not lose your heart. Because this journey is long, like a marathon. When you get tired, do not give up. Look unto Jesus. Consider him. Actually, the Greek word for consider, it actually means calculate. See, examine carefully what Christ has done and calculate what cost he paid for what gain. What was he looking at? The joy set before him. The joy of seeing you and me being rescued from sin and being able to live our life as a children of God, beloved children of God, worshipers who can enter into God's presence. Oh, we will receive, we will find new strength to endure being poured upon our lives from the throne, from the cross of Jesus Christ. Let me wrap up today's message. Two points of application. First of all, let us exercise ruthless removal of sin. It says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us lay aside every weight. It may not be sin, but in order for me to run this race, I need to shed this extra weight. 
Let me give up what is okay because I want to receive God's very best. And number two, let's fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. That's how we will receive the strength to endure so that we can run this race with endurance. This race will require perseverance. Let us fix our eyes upon Jesus so that from his cross we may find strength to endure. Our life is a race. There's a great cloud of witnesses, heavenly audience watching. They are not mere spectators. There were one team in the relay. They gave us this baton of faith. And they are cheering us on. Run the race. Run it well. Finish it well. And don't drop the baton. Pass it on to next generation. And they say, you got to share the extra weight. Lay aside every weight and sin. And run with endurance. You're going to need to persevere. Look unto Jesus. He will give you strength to endure. Look unto the cross of Jesus. He will give you strength to serve. Strength to love. Let us pray. In your own words, would you ask the Lord, Lord, help me to lay aside every weight. Lord Jesus, I confess my sin. I renounce my sin. I declare my sin set, crucified on Jesus. And Lord Jesus, I want to lay aside every weight. It may not be sin, but I will let go so I can receive the very best that God has for me. And I want to run this race with endurance. Jesus, I look to you. Give me the strength to endure in your own